What's up? Welcome in. We might as well keep it going on this uh, day that, at least for me, John Z started at four in the morning in Minneapolis. That's why you skip the season finale when you know everybody's getting canned in the morning. I was good. How much coffee? Oh, I got some espresso right here, right now. 907 p.m.? You're going to be up for a little bit. Okay. Well, I am going to be up for a little bit because I got more to write. I got plenty of more work to do. So it's uh, it's been you one of those thoughts. days. We kind of we knew it would be that way, and that's okay. Welcome in a live edition of Hogan Johns to end this eventful day uh, where both Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace were fired. And then for the second straight year, we got a press conference that um, angered a lot of fans. <laughs> to put it quite frankly, it put to put it quite mildly, but yes, that, that too. It, the the longer it went, the the worse it got. We're gonna go through some of it, but yes, another one, another one. Ah, <laughs> uh, man, where do we start? I I mean, I guess, I, I guess um, we start with just the news before we get to the press conference i think we should we should uh just discuss the big changes that were made today um he, we both expected matt Nagy to get fired the question was would ryan pace go you uh have had a gut feeling last night that you you uh made very clear on the podcast and um i could definitely see it coming too and that's ultimately what uh, happened today this morning what was your initial reaction it was since you got you all your sleep and you were ready to go for the day. <laughs> yeah, enjoy, enjoying my morning coffee working the phones with sweatpants on all that stuff yes um my initial reaction really was what's next like what is going to be said in this press conference because we expect the man Nagy to be fired i expected ryan pace to be fired it didn't work out. The pairing with Trubisky, the pairing with Justin Fields, just didn't work out. Changes were coming. So for me, my initial reaction is, what the hell is going to happen in this press conference? Who is going to be leading this charge? I thought it was going to be George McCaskey, and it is George McCaskey. But what's going to be said? Who's going to help him? How is this going to play out for the Chicago Bears in 2022? Yeah, and... and we talked about this. I, I, I feel like it was on one of these recent podcasts in the last few days. I may have even been yesterday. It's all blurring together. Um, but I remember saying this. Whatever happens, even if they clean house and everybody's happy, a couple hours are going to go by, and then there's going to be that reality that sets in. Okay, what's next? Because you still got to hire the next people, and you got to get it right. Um, and then the George McCaskey press conference with Ted Phillips on the side still happened. And I think everybody's sitting there going, why should they have any confidence in this now going forward? It's very, it felt so similar to 2015. It did. This year's Ernie Acorsi is Bill Pulliam. Mm -hmm. Harold, the former GM. I get it. I understand why you need help like that. The Bears aren't the first team to enlist help like that. You could question why they need help like that. As the Bears, as one of the founding franchises of this great league that we all love, sure, question that all you want. But here we are. It just, I think that's what maybe bothers me a, a lot is because even with Lamar Sue Campbell involved, even with Tanisha Wade involved, you still have George McCaskey, Ted Phillips, and an advisor involved in this process. It just feels so similar to 2015. Yeah, I, and look, let me get the one good thing out of the way here first. You could do a lot worse than Bill Polian in that room. Okay, so if you – in. It still goes back to what I just said. Who You were going to have the moment no matter what. Who's doing the hiring? What's happening? Because 
even if you kick Ted out of the picture, which he's not out of the picture, but even if you were going to do that, it just leaves George. And so they had to bring somebody in. So that part doesn't bother me that much, to be honest with you. I mean, they had to bring somebody in. Does it feel like 2015? It absolutely feels like 2015. And that's, I think, the problem is everything just seems to be the same. And Ted is still involved. Ted's still going to be doing the interviewing. For now, yes. Um, the other good thing I was going to say that I've, I, I I think it's a very good thing that Soup Campbell's involved. Yeah. I because, actually like that a lot. Yeah. Um, little background on Soup. Came from Wisconsin. Um, highly, highly respected. And ever since he's been with the Bears, he is somebody that has been close with the players because in his role as director of player engagement, like he handles a lot of the off the field stuff that players go through. Where are you going to live? What's this issue that pops up? You know, he, in, in uh, sorry to interject in, in my column today with Kevin Fishbane, um, I tried to paint a picture of where soup's office is. Soup Campbell's office is directly between the cafeteria and the the locker room slash players lounge. They're right yep. there. It's so like in order to get to those, you you have to almost like pass through Soup Campbell's office. And there are players when we were allowed in House Hall, when we, when we'd walk to the locker room, players were always in there. Always in there. It's like the perfect spot for team gossip, team needs, team conversation. I love that move by the Bears. I, I will commend them, commend them in that. Yeah, I, I think he's their best hope to get it right, to be honest. Um, and he comes from an administrative background at Wisconsin. He, he's, a, he's a former player. So he's going to understand, because I think if one of the many fair questions asked today was about the age of the people doing the hirings here now, right? And so... Soup's going to bring that younger vibe and opinion. <laughs> he's, he's just younger than the rest of them. Yeah, he, it's just what it is. But he's going to relate better to what the players and the roster need. So, you know, in a lot of ways, he's probably not to this point in his career, but he's that – when people say, like, what would the director of football ops guy do if that position existed, which it's not because George loves the structure that they have – but that's kind of like what you're talking about. Like a guy who doesn't have control over the roster, but can be a checks and balances for the person who does make the roster decisions and has a full picture of the whole building and the, and the players and the connections. And, and so I do think that that's a really, um, really good move. And bringing in Tanisha Wade, too. For soup, he's a better sounding board than Ted Phillips could ever be because Ted Phillips, his office is on the second floor. It's not between the locker room and the cafeteria. Players don't talk to Ted Phillips. Yeah, they're not interacting. Yes, in terms of like a, a sounding board for George McCaskey, Soup Campbell could be there. And, and I've met Tanisha Wade. I've interviewed Tanisha Wade. I, I was very impressed when I first met her. She was basically the director of – events when I met her. She put on the training camp at, at Hell's Hall. She was in charge of that. And she struck me as just very great with like everybody she worked with. So I imagine the the feedback, having a different voice, different questions, different concerns. I see a lot of value in that. Yeah. So all right, so that's the good stuff. Got that out of the way. Um so they don't want it to be like it's all doom and gloom. But at the end of the day, you're right. It still feels like 2015. Um, and one of my first questions was, so George comes out and says, the GM, the new GM will no longer report to Ted, will report to George. And this was one of my problems right off the bat, Johnsy. 
made sure to point out that it was it was Ted's idea. Ted persuaded me that because of the stadium, essentially, and all the work with the with the stadium that we may or may not be building. He's, he's not wrong, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that the new GM should report directly to me. I'm, you know, that's basically what George said. Even if that's true, the fans don't want to hear that. Just come out with some strength <laughs> and say, this is what's happening. The GM is no longer reporting to Ted Phillips. Ted's going to handle the stadium. And because when you say it's Ted's idea, it sounds like Ted's still running the show. <laughs> if anything, it was just like this optics public relations move. Now, now I, I actually I believe George. I think both that it was Ted's I, idea. No, 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 no. That that. <laughs> Well, yes, that's true. That the next GM, whoever that person is, is going to report to George. You and I have had that sense for for a little bit here. Yeah. Um, but to come out and like say this, I I just felt like it was like a pre-planned public relations statement in a sense that wasn't carried out as but, well as planned. But if it is, then that's not what you want to say. I know that's what I mean. That's, that's what, what I don't what understand. I'm, that's what I. That's what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's late. I got the giggles a little bit. Well, and that's okay. There was there was plenty to giggle about. <laughs> I got the giggles. <laughs> By the way, one of those to, days we jumped in so quickly. We appreciate everybody following along uh, with us live as we do this on YouTube. If you're listening as a podcast later, we appreciate you as well. You can follow us on Twitter at Adam Hogue at Adam Johns for all the coverage from today, and there's plenty of it. You can read me at NBCSportsChicago.com, Johnsy on the Athletic, theAthletic.com slash Hogan Johns uh, is where you go to subscribe. And uh, we should probably plug obvious shirts. Is I got hat. that. I got that Hogan Johns hat on. These are awesome. Um, check those out. Sweatshirts. We appreciate everything that uh, Obvious Shirts does with the podcast and uh, and all the charity work involved too. It's it, it's awesome. Um, so if you're just catching us right here, make sure you check all that out. Um, can I? Sorry, can I? Uh, yeah, you could jump right back. You, in. you know, <laughs> please do. Like, unless they they like create a new position for somebody. Um, like, so Ted Phillips, like team budgets, like scouting budgets, equipment budgets, like all of that landed on his desk. More often than not, if you talk to people in that, that building, he signed off on it. It's not a problem. He may ask you a few questions why you need this, that, or the other, but he signed off on it. So I would imagine in terms of some type of restructuring that someone else would step into that role. But I was just thinking about that just in terms – I can't imagine this next GM going up to George McCaskey and explaining a travel budget to him, right? Like, I need this because a bunch of us are going to the Senior Bowl. You know, this is what my my West Coast scout needs, you know? Right. You know, this is the mileage that he adds up when when he's going from campus to campus. I I can't imagine – that being on the table of George McCaskey now. So I imagine someone else in terms of the approval, the money, the budgetary stuff, where Ted Phillips was always involved, is going to step into that. Let's do this. Our, our great producer, Ken Garrison, um, if you're listening on the uh, audio side of the podcast, you heard the uh, another amazing another amazing open for this uh, what's becoming an annual event here. Um, sent me a ton of audio to play, and it's kind of like a game because I, I didn't have time to go through it, and I'm just I don't know what's I don't know what's gonna. We also have your voicemails by the way, which we got to play at some point. Um, so I mean, let's just uh, let's just. Start hitting some random buttons and see what happens here. I expect that um, Ted's advice and counsel will be uh, drawn on uh, just as it has for uh, many years. But as I said, ultimately, the general manager will report to the chairman 
and uh, the decision on the hiring ultimately is mine. Okay. Look at you. It's talent. Topical. I, uh, yeah, that was an accent. But one of my first questions was if, if the GM's no longer going to report to Ted, then why is Ted involved in hiring the GM? Well, he's going to be the one that negotiates the contract was basically George's answer. All right. Not sure why that you can negotiate the con like Joey Lane's been negotiating all the contracts for the Bears. He's not the one that's out there, you know, picking the the picking the players. I like I understand it. Like remember the story about Trace Armstrong and Ted Phillips up late negotiating the deal for for Matt Nagy. Like th this is part of it. That's why. Yeah. Like I understand that, but but like he can you have come Cliff in Stein, a former that. agent. You have Cliff Stein, a former agent in your in your building. Yeah, Cliff used to do that stuff. I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Oh. <laughs> that's just it. <laughs> that's it. That's yeah, that's 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 fine. Well, I, I would say I would say this that um, the hiring of Ryan Pace and Matt Nagy. I don't regret that. Um, they both brought a lot to the Bears. Now, up to ultimately on the field, the results weren't where we wanted it to, but um, I think they've checked a lot of the boxes. Um, you can't ask for better leaders. You can't ask for better forward thinkers. You can't ask for people that um, gave their all, had great work ethic, were humble. And we're going to look for a lot of those same qualities and hopefully with uh, Bill's uh, vast expertise uh, in the technicalities of, of uh, coaching strategy and uh, valuation processes, that that's going to uh, add a nice added benefit to our search and going to help us find the right people. Just like it did with Ernie and Corsi. Like, that's the problem. I feel like... I feel like some people felt like Bill Polian was getting unfairly dragged through the mud here today. Um, it's not that it's not that Bill Polian's involved. Nobody's against Bill Polian being involved. Again, somebody had to be the advisor. Someone had to come in and help these guys. So it doesn't doesn't shock me at all, um, unless they went out and they said, you know, we have a director of football operations, and I think that's what people want to hear. And then that guy was going to go fine, but that's not the, the direction they went. So it's not that Bill Polian's involved. It's that, once again, this is the route they have to go. Because they're not competent enough to make the hirings on their own. They have to bring in somebody else to do it. And there's a lack of credibility there because last time it didn't really work. And it led to an awkward GM head coaching pairing right away with Ryan Pace and John Fox. And three immediate losing seasons as they tried to go through a rebuild. So that's what people are upset about. People are upset that Ted's still involved in it, which is fair. And I think more importantly, John's where I come in on this is, so you, you make the hire. Then Ernie goes away. And now that guy, whoever he is, is reporting directly to George. So once again, there's that lack of checks and balances. There's not the accountability above the GM. Because, come on. Look, one of George's strengths is he says yes to things like, let's trade for Khalil Mack. What does he say no to? Because as he pointed out today, two damning things I thought. One, he admitted it. He's a fan. He's not a football evaluator. Those are his words. Okay? The other thing, he was flat out, what was the word he used um, when he said that Matt Nagy came to him to ask him about Justin Fields? 
about playing Justin Fields? What did oh, he say? Oh, yeah. Um, what uncomfortable. Did he say? uncomfortable. I think he said uncomfortable with it. So the guy who the GM reports to is uncomfortable when he is asked about personnel decisions. And I think that's a problem because you look at a lot of other organizations. First of all, any job. I know you and I have editors. We have producers. We have people that we bounce ideas off of all the time. That's a healthy thing, I think, in any job. So if the GM doesn't really have that person above him to do that, just whoever he hires around him, I think it leads to mistakes. So I, I, I that's what I worry about with going forward with this structure. And, I, and once again, they sit there in a press conference and they say, we love our structure, but I'm not a football evaluator. Can I play devil's advocate for a second? Please try. Who is hiring that president of football operations? Well. <laughs> the same person who's hiring this GM and coach? Well, I, I, maybe, but I, I guess you were, you were kind of hoping that they were going to come through with a Bill Polian type. Or say, hey, we actually do have this Trace Armstrong guy who's going to give up. His, it was a long shot, but you know he's going to give up his agency and, and come in, and he's somebody we trust, and he's going to be the guy. I th I always felt like that was probably not going to happen. Like Ozzy Newsom would have been my dream candidate. Sure. Somehow pulling Chris Ballard away from the Colts. And saying he's the top guy, he's going to hire his own GM. You know, these are all ideas, and they could have. But here's the thing, Johnson. Even if they had come out and at least announced today that they were going to try to do that, even though you're right, who's going to be the one hiring that guy? It would have signaled something different. Instead of we're just we're running it right back. The same strategy we used in 2015. I still think this can be different than 2015. And I thought I gave George McCaskey an opportunity to explain how this could be different than 2015. Well, we, I mean, we tried. We asked him eight different times. There was not a young quarterback of the caliber of Justin Fields on the Bears roster in 2015. Instead, the Bears were very unattractive team to be in charge of you had an aging roster problems on that roster your quarterback one you may not have wanted was signed for two more years of guaranteed money lots of it you weren't left with a lot from the former GM this is different 20 compared to 2015 like now you have Justin Fields Quarterback in itself, himself, should make the Bears an attractive destination for GMs and head coaches. But then you got Roquan Smith. Back in 2015, Shane McClellan became the starting inside linebacker for the Chicago Bears. But are you, I, I get what you're saying, Johns, but are you trying to say that it wasn't an attractive job in 2015? Yes, yes, absolutely it wasn't. Okay, but they still had Chris Ballard there who wanted the job and they could have hired him. Mm. I don't know. You also had Eric DaCosta and George Patton decline interviews. Yeah, that's fair. That's a fair point. I'm just saying I still think they could have gotten it right. No, this isn't that the story of the Bears? It's like the Bruce Arian story. Right. I mean, well, that's and that's the guy was in your building. It's not just the story of the Bears. It's it's specifically the story of this last decade under George McCaskey. Yes. These things keep happening, and all the fans want is some type of confidence that it's not going to happen again. And all the respect in the world to Bill Polian, who may be who may get this right. And again, I have confidence that, that Sue Campbell can help get this right. But it's still the same strategy. It's still Ted Phillips being there. And at the end of the day, whoever they hire has full say over football and reports to George McCaskey. So 
it's almost like a prayer that they're just going to luck out this time and get the right guy. And maybe they will. Maybe they will. Do you think they should involve Justin Field in some capacity in this? I, I'm not talking about, like, flying the kid around from town to town to town or have him listening in every single Zoom conference asking questions. But I think at some point you have to involve the quarterback. I know maybe he hasn't earned it, but you know what? A lot of teams try to build their rosters around having a young, talented quarterback on his rookie deal. Don't you want to have a better sense if that re- that relationship can work from the actual person involved in it? Uh, I mean, you know, I think if certain things come up here, um, maybe you bounce something off them. Mm. I want more. Because you know what? You have to learn from your past mistakes. How did things turn out with Mr. Trubisky and Matt Nagy? I, you think they could have they could have ended differently had somebody else been hired? You never know. Like if Mitch had vetoed you Matt never Nagy. Know. No, I'm not. Veto is a strong word there. I, I think it, it, if three, anything, I think the way Mitch's career played out is further proof that he shouldn't have had. I think if you have it. two or three candidates, how about oh, how did Matt Nagy's career play out? I no, mean, I, it, you know, it, just to you know throw that in there. I'm just. Say you got two or three finalists, and you're having a tough time separating them. Some extra information from your quarterback, if he has lunch with the guy, wouldn't hurt. Yeah. I I, I guess you I ask, agree. I I guess I agree with you on that. I don't think it hurts. I don't. Ask, I, I'm also not too caught up in it. You ask anybody in this league. I think even Ryan Pace said it, said it himself. Like, the most important relationship in that building is the head coach and the quarterback. And I think we've seen multiple instances with this franchise where that has gone completely all right. Yeah. Jay Cutler getting benched for Jimmy Clausen by Mark Tressman. The whole Matt Nagy thing with Nick Foles and Andy Dalton coming in. I'm just saying, if you want it to be different, then make it different. Don't just hope it's going to be different. Yeah. Adam Johns? Hey, George. <laughs> hey, George. Come on, Kent. Is that for real? That was, that was for Let's real. Let's go ahead, hit that again. I like that. Yeah. Adam Johns? Hey, George. All right, let's see what else we can meander through here. We were evaluating throughout the season. Um we didn't have any preconceived notions about um, a particular time line or a particular timetable. Um, our evaluation was concluded last night and resulted in the decisions that we announced this morning. Do you buy that? Play it again. We were evaluating throughout the season. Um, we didn't have any preconceived notions about um, a particular time line or a particular timetable. Um, our evaluation was concluded last night and resulted in the decisions that we announced this morning. Oh, I think they knew before the game, yeah. yeah. They were just going to do what they've always done and waited for the season to be over. I would love to know, because George kind of dodged the question, how long Bill Bolian's been involved in this? I think, I, I think it's been more than a few weeks. And, like, here's the thing. You just don't make your decision this morning and then text Bill Bolian, hey, what are you doing for the next couple of weeks? Right, <laughs> and, and, that's, and, and, and that's okay. I, I, I just – Hey, Soup, you want to raise? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got some things going on. Like, no, this has been in play for a while. Right, well, and I, you know – I mentioned how that they were doing homework on GM candidates, and and I, I honestly through all that I didn't really know who was the one doing it. Now I I imagine it was Bill Polian that was sniffing around, it, trying to because he wasn't technically employed with the team yet, or I don't again I don't know when the timeline and all this, but um, it makes a little bit more sense now I think. So, um, yeah, what I do believe is that the decision was not made before Thanksgiving. Even, yeah. 
that you know what week, I'm talking mean, about. That week? Yeah, the patch.com report, yes. Yeah. Uh, Ted Phillips is in charge of that project. And I think the best way to explain it is um, anybody who's bought a house or a lot to build a house, there's a time between when the property is under contract and closing. And during that time, there are a number of things that need to be done in terms of due diligence, making sure that there's clear title to the lot, house or lot. Um, if it's a lot, determining whether it's a buildable lot and so forth. Uh, a lot of regulations that need to be checked out. Well, in a property of this size, that closing, the time between under contract and closing is vastly expanded. So there's a lot of due diligence that needs to be performed uh, before we can close. So that's on the Arlington Park situation. Yeah, <laughs> you know, when he was saying that, like I visualized my home inspection, you know, when we were buying a house and how long that took just for a, a home. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine inspecting a property that size takes a while, but that's besides the point. Um, that's going to be Ted Phillips' job. It's going to happen, Adam. It's going to happen. What, yeah, Arlington? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's. It. I thought there was actually one very telling, uh, significant quote in there today from Ted Phillips. I uh, don't have it in front of me right now, but he, you know, he essentially said that that property is the only property they are looking at building on. Yes. Like, and I read that as the city too. Like they're not building a new stadium in the city. So, now whether or not that was a negotiating. Little nugget that they threw in there, you know, to continue to put pressure on the city. I don't know. But um, now there's still some snags that could happen and some politicking. And I do know one thing that there's, I don't want to call it an issue, but there's some negotiating that needs to be figured out between Lake County and Cook County because Arlington is so close to the Lake County border. You know, like 53 going north ends at Lake Cook Road. Like, and they've been buying land forever to try to extend 53 North into Lake County. It's never happened. So, like, there's going to be some politicking behind the scenes to make sure the infrastructure is set. Um, but, yeah, I think it's probably happening. <laughs> you got to get everything in order before you ask for that taxpayer money, too, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if they can even get that. I don't know. Let's see. I'm sorry. I don't understand your question. I just want to play that one again. Why should oh, Bears fans trust that this time, regardless of the people you guys hire and their individual qualities, that it's going to result in wins on the field? Yeah, Adam, that's the important thing. And I don't think we're going to convince them today, or like I said, perhaps even the day that our next general manager and head coach are introduced. Um, we've got to have results on the field. Um, that's the only thing that matters. And that's when um, we'll win Bears fans over. Um, Bill Paulian talks in his books about um, decisions he made as a general manager that were considered wildly unpopular at the time, um, but eventually they bore fruit. And you have to be ready and willing to make what may very well be an unpopular decision if you're convinced it's best for the Bears. I couldn't believe he referenced the darn book. <laughs> Can't get those book sales in. <laughs> Uh, it Can was, we talk about the start too? I was waiting for you. It was so weird. First of all, it was nice for him to start with a you know a shout out to the Dickersons and sending the condolences. But I don't even know why it was necessary to bring up the Nagy's kid getting heckled at his high school playoff game. But the transition between talking about Parker Dickerson and just because he's the same age as Matt Nagy's kids, it was so... What? 
It was unnecessary. It was awkward. It was Kevin Fishbane um, was fu- furious about it. Actually, he sh- I think he shared his thoughts on on Twitter. It was it was bad. It was a bad look. Like like it was the jumping off point to to tell fans to stop being mean. Like it was just. I get the point with the the fire naggy fans or the fire the chant chanting at the Suns football game, but it's just awkward and unnecessary. You know that's the type of stuff though that why like other owners talk more during the season. Like that's something that could have been addressed around Thanksgiving if George had decided to actually talk and clear the air of what happened that week like some o- other owners would have and it wouldn't have been so forced in the end of the season press conference because you talk one time a year and you felt like compelled that you had to say something about it because there was absolutely no connection with parker dickerson at all other than the fact that he is also a, a kid and by the way he's 11 and man Aggie's son is a junior in high school, so a little different there, too. <laughs> like, I appreciate the thought. I miss J.D. a lot. You miss J.D. a lot. We all miss J.D. a lot. Like, I appreciate that. I appreciate the thought. I appreciate what the Vikings did. But at the same time, I don't like how he, it was used to butter us up. That's a good way to put it. Felt a bit inappropriate for me. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, and that was the start. Like that. It wasn't good that like a minute into it, I was like already. My brain was already scrambling. Like, <laughs> wait, what? Just what? Uh, one more JD thought. I I I kind of at one point like visioned him getting a big kick out of this whole thing, just laughing. Oh, somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially once you brought up Olin Groots. Oh, we should. And get to holy that. moly, like. <laughs> go ahead, preface this because this was. I don't know if we have that specific cut. Here's one that's listed as former players. So let's see what this is. Uh, we love it that our former players feel so strongly about wanting the Bears to be successful. Um, a lot of them are season ticket holders. Um, we welcome their input. I would say as a general proposition, I'm probably uh, more reluctant to seek the feedback of players who um, are former players who are on media outlets. I don't want to have to put them in the position of deciding what is a confidential conversation and what is okay to share with on the air. Um, We reach out to our former players on a regular basis and look forward to continuing to do that. Okay. So translation on that is you don't trust them to differentiate between what's a confidential conversation and what goes on the air. Um, because that's what's part about being in the media is that's what you, that's part of your job. And uh, you're, you Bill don't want to put them know. in that position Bill, is another Bill way Pullion of saying know. you don't trust them. Uh, Bill Polian would know. Um. <laughs> yeah. Bill Polian has 17 radio shows. Um, if they did indeed talk to Tony Dungy, which uh, George would not admit uh, he is on uh, TV every week. Um, isn't he still on TV every week? He is. He is. Yeah. He, he yeah. stands next to Drew, uh, Drew Brees. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, if you think a former player could, could provide <laughs> invaluable insight in how to run a franchise, like Owen Cruz is a smart man. Patrick Manley, another former Bear now in the media, is the longest tenured Bear. I know he's a long snapper. Love you, Pat. But the dude knows something about how locker rooms work. What a good teammate looks like. He's played with some outstanding players and some horseshit players. Sorry for swearing, YouTube. 
like it's recognizing what you have in your building first again, right? Like how often do we see players, former players become coaches? Like it happens, I feel like frequently with the Patriots. Guys stick around, find jobs with teams. They're in the coaching. Some of them go in the scouting. Some of them get in the front office jobs. Know what you have in front of you. Right? Like that's that's what I thought, you know, before he, you know, doubled down on Olin Krutz to try to dunk on the guy. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have that cut right here, but I think everyone's probably heard it at this point or knows what happened. So, I, I'll, I'll, just a little inside. I had that on my list, but pretty far down the list. Like, depending on how long the press conference was going to go, it's hard with these Zooms. You don't really know how many questions you're going to be able to get in. And we basically got late enough in the presser where I felt like most things had been answered. We're starting to get a couple silly questions sprinkled in there here and there. Um, And it actually did seem relevant because that was a relatively embarrassing story that came out from Olin Kurtz that he was disrespected with an offer for $15 an hour. And I wanted to know if George knew about it at the time and what his reaction was whenever he heard about it. And then he basically just called Dolan a liar. <laughs> Dunked on him. I, and I was kind of caught off guard. Like, if you actually hear the audio, it's like... You you can probably hear it in my voice. I'm like, so you're saying it's not true? <laughs> um and then he and he tripled down at that point. The um response that you shared from former players. Yeah. I mean they're Owen's beloved. Well, did you hear Owen's hit on the score after that? Yeah. I mean he was and rightfully so, very upset about it because he's essentially having his credibility called out. He immediately called Harry Heastan to make sure he had his side of the story right. He called Ryan Pace today after he had already been fired. And I think there was some clarification there that Ryan gave him that was shared on the radio by Olin that it was... I think technically a training camp internship, and that's kind of the going rate for what they pay those guys. So maybe there was a misunderstanding in there. But even as Olin acknowledged that, he's like, we didn't name call. We had an adult conversation. We we clarified what it was, and George could have done the same thing. Even if he wasn't prepared to talk about it today, he could have said, you know what? It's something I need to look into. I'm not fully aware of that story. I look forward to talking to Olin and whoever else is involved to get the full story. Instead, he said, everything you hear from Olin Krutz comes with a grain of salt. And by the way, at the end of the day, the story was correct. It was an offer for $15 an hour. And Olin went on a whole thing. I encourage you to listen to it about how all the things he's given the organization, how he played on a Liz Frank torn ligament in his last game as a bear, and how George has never called him once to check on him or see how his long-term health is or anything like that. Like It's pretty damning stuff when you actually heard him respond the way he did. Um... So anyway, and then I I was hearing from a number of former players, which is what you were just referencing, John, that it's not just Olin upset about this. Like, they weren't happy with their former teammate getting called out like that. Erroneously, quite frankly. And it speaks to a larger issue that has been brought up. It was in Dan Dan Weeder's lengthy story a few weeks ago where he was quoting former players. There's been this growing divide between the organization and the alumni. And 
I just find it remarkable that somehow there's like this section of the former players too that happen to be from the most success, the most recent successful era when you went to a Super Bowl. That like has kind of especially been targeted as like enemies, or that's how they're treated. I think that's how they feel. And I just don't think it's healthy. I don't see why it's good for the organization. Um, and I just think it's making matters worse. I yeah, don't, I, don't, I, I, I feel like it's because they're in the media. Like, they're, they're your colleagues at Embassy Sports. Um, well, it's like that quote, we've already played it, like, Yes, but the media. correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like Dan Hampton's been on the radio forever just ripping the hell out of the Bears. Yeah. Now I got him a Super Bowl. Maybe that's a bit different, but, you know, Doug Buffon, got to rest his soul. Like, like, OB, like, this is Chicago, right? It Former players off, have thoughts. It comes off like they just don't want to hear the truth from their former players. I think that's part of the problem. I think that's what concerns me about this. I'm just hit it. Go ahead. I'm just a fan. I'm not a football evaluator. Uh, that was his response to my question about Justin Fields. Um, but that's part of the larger concern here. Is is it not? I lost my train of thought there. Like this coaching search. The disconnect between your football minds, like guys you should know, guys you should respect, guys you may want to hit up for advice. Going outside the organization for help again. I don't know. It's all a bad look. <sighs> Truthfully, I wasn't surprised by what came today. Um, my expectations were low. Um I think if George had come out and said Ted is not going to be part of this. Ted is going to focus on the stadium. When the time comes, he will be the one that negotiates the contract and finalizes that because that's part of his job as president and CEO of our company. But he's not going to be actively involved in the search process. I think that would have gone a long way. Do you think help. that's a win today? I think that would have been a Before win. Before your own stuff? Um, I think I I think then the Bill Polian thing makes a lot of you know, comes off a lot differently, even though I think the Bill Polian thing's a good thing. Without a doubt. But I just like and instead we're gonna leave lean heavily on a guy who is in the Hall of Fame with a long history of hiring Really good head coaches like Marv Levy and Tony Dungy and a bunch of others, and he could have listed them all off. Um, then brought up Soup Campbell, said this is our committee. Doesn't the whole thing just seem different? It, it seems more different then. Because you still had to bring in somebody to help, and you can make the argument that they brought in one of the best in Bill Polian. Of all the options out there, Um. Like, why can't you just bring Ted in at the end and negotiate the deal instead of having him in the room the whole time? Yep. Um, I think that that would have added to the... I think that would have made a big difference with the credibility. But that's obviously not what he wants to do. He trusts Ted. What do you say? I trust Ted unequivocally. Is that what he said? Close. Something like that. Um, And it just gives off the vibe that even though the GM's going to report to George now, nothing's really different. Could have been, man. It could have been. Um, yeah. I do think, you know, when he mentioned David Montgomery and Roquan Smith, I feel like last year at this time. Implicity, we were, by the way, was the word. The word. That he used. Thanks to our uh, viewers that are watching. When, oh, wow. A couple of them. Three of them. Um, like, remember last year when we, I think it was Mark Potash asked for, uh, like an example of one player 
some young player, and, and then Darnell Mooney was thrown out there. Remember that? Like when he mentioned David Montgomery and Roquan Smith in his open, like like he was prepared. I, they're gonna ask me about a player. Well, here's two players right away. Like I, I thought, that, like that reminded me of last year when Darnell Mooney's name was just thrown out there. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. All right, let's do this. Let's play your voicemails because we got your voicemail reaction right after the press conference ended. Um, then we'll come back, and before we get out of here, discuss what's next because regardless of what happened in this press conference, they do have to hire a GM and head coach, and we'll see if they can get that right. But uh, here are your voicemails from today. Think you do it? Yes. What did it cost Wow, they did it. They actually got rid of Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace. This is a hopeful new future for the Bears. Oh, wait, hold on. George McCaskey's uh, press conference is start. Oh, 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 no. Oh, no. Hey, it's Jake from Colorado. I am uh, five minutes into George McCaskey's press conference, and I had to pause and just call in and ask, why the f*** did I ever think anything would be different? They won't ever admit it a fault. And it's just sickening. Hey, ho, hey, John. Uh, first time caller from the city. I can't deal with the incompetence of this organization. It's, it's ridiculous, and I don't know how much I can deal with it. Hey, it's Joey from Texas. George didn't say where he met Bill Polian, but I think we all know is that a book signing. Bear down. I honestly didn't think there was any way to top last season, but George calling out not only former players, but other members of his staff, and himself calling himself not a football evaluator. This is all time. I mean, in terms of Bears press conferences, this was a legendary one in all the wrong ways, but what'd you expect? It's the Bears. Uh, I could have sworn it's 2022 right now, not 2021. What did I just watch? Go Bears. So a year has passed and the George McCaskey end of the oppressors remain the best and worst thing for every Bears fan around. This organization is just clueless and it continues to do the same sh every time. You no, know, guys, I'm not really much of a football guy, but I'm going to make sure I hire the best GM and head coach for the most important positions in the organization. I'm but I'm not a football guy though. I am not a football I'm just a fan. Uh, this is Pat from Chicago. I didn't even listen, and I think I got just as much out of it as the rest of you guys did. I'm, I'm just confused. Do they do they like Justin Fields? Does the coach need to like Justin Fields? Are, are we just going to keep trading for more quarterbacks? Just just confusion. Hello, this is George McCaskey. Um, I just want to say that my mommy thinks I'm doing a really good job and that I should stay in my position and that I get an A+. Plus. Hey, so the complete lack of self-awareness from George and Ted is just heartbreaking. Maybe they'll just accidentally get it right. I think that's the best we can hope for at this point. So, yeah, here's hoping that they accidentally discover penicillin. Thanks. Go Bears, I guess. Whatever. First of all, I totally appreciate the uh, in sync. Let me just put that out there right away. I appreciate the Avengers Infinity War reference. Oh yeah, right off the bat there. Yeah, hit hit them all. Um, you can keep your in sync. <laughs> no, no, you can't. I will keep it forever in my heart. Okay. Bye, bye, bye. Uh, it was a good touch. Look. I think those voicemails uh, sum things up pretty well there. They, oh, I, was, I know what I was going to say. It's a little harsh on the uh, Virginia McCaskey reference, but it is a fair point with the board. Like when George comes out and says the board has told me they want me to, to remain in this job, it, it kind of just emphasizes the lack of accountability throughout the organization, doesn't it? Because who on that board is going to make a change? It's all family members. I'm going to read them off. Can I read them off? Yeah, go for it. 
Virginia McCaskey. McCaskey. Virginia McCaskey. What did I say? No, McCaskey? I'm just saying. I'm gonna I, every time oh, you say oh, McCaskey, you're gonna, you're gonna, I'm gonna make okay. sure everyone understands it's a McCaskey. Okay. Virginia McCaskey, secretary. McCaskey. George H. McCaskey, chairman. Ted Phillips, president and CEO. Brian Basically, J. Basically, I think McCaskey at this point. Yeah, Ted yes. Phillips. Brian J. McCaskey. Ed McCaskey Jr. Patrick McCaskey. Andrew McKenna and Pat Ryan. So um, Andrew McKenna is like ninety two, isn't he? And Pat Ryan's not exactly young. He's in his eighties as well. So who on that board is coming out and being like <laughs> You're You know what, George? Um you've you really haven't done anything in a decade in this job. If your plan is to, because remember, George said they like talked about all this. Everybody was consulted. Here's the plan. Your plan is to still have Ted involved in the coaching, in the GM coaching search. And now the GM is going to report to you and you're not a football evaluator. You said that. Like, doesn't, shouldn't that raise a red flag on any board? In the point of a board to have like many differing opinions, again, I go back to checks and balances just to make sure like, hey, is this really the right thing for our company? If I've learned one thing from comic book movies is that when the board fires the um, founder of a business, that founder becomes like a, a criminal. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? You know, is this Batman? No, Batman became a good guy, but Batman was yeah. just like you, you know. I, I'm thinking of um, the Green Guy, the Green Goblin oh, okay. from Marvel. You're Harry little, Osborn. A little too deep for me. Yeah, Norman Osborn. I'm with you to a point. <laughs> but I, I just think when that part came up today, it was like kind of like, eh, well, I guess when you consider that, then really none of this is surprising. No, that was awkward. Yeah. Th that's extremely awkward. Um, especially, you know, he, when he's, he's explaining that to us and everybody in that Zoom call knows who's on that board. Right? It's I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, because he, he's a my family and Ted, who I'm going to keep employed. By the way, that dynamic right there seems like a conflict of interest, but... And Ted, who I'm going to keep employed, they all want me to keep stay. Of course they want you to stay. I guess my, my biggest concern in all of this, because we saw it play out with Ernie Accorsi, and I'm hoping Bill Polian is different. But like, like once John Fox became available, like you knew that was going to be the Bears guy, right? Because that was Ernie Accorsi's guy going back to their days with the Giants. Mm-hmm. These guys stay within their trees. Yeah, they listen to what their ownership and whoever they're working for wants, but more often than not, they stay within their trees, right? Well, they know and who they is, know. This this was this was it gets back to a couple things that we've we've addressed here. One is So you're just gonna lean on Bill Paul? Like so is the GM gonna get get say in the coach? Because you told you told everybody that with Ryan, but Ryan didn't really have say, as it turned out. Remember how awkward that was? Yeah. And that okay, now let's clarify this. Uh, yes, eventually that was Ryan Pace's hire. But it was like I don't think it was the guy he wanted to hire. No, no, but but by that point you're already so well into the hiring process. The Bears have simultaneous searches going on again. Where this interview group, this search committee, is going to interview head coaching candidates before that GM is hired. I know what he wants. George would like to hire that GM first. But you know what? Didn't work out that way in 2015. Yeah. It didn't. It just didn't. They want to, they want to do everything the same. Like they're going to get different results. And, 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 and again, I, I, I think the reason why it matters that they don't want to hear the opinions of outspoken former players, the reason that's concerning 
is because when Chris Ballard comes into your building and wants to shake things up and says, I, yes, I'd like to be your GM, but I don't think Jay Cutler should be the quarterback and we got to move Ted around. They don't want to hear that stuff. And then they go hire the other guy. Or when Dave Tobe doesn't think Jay Cutler should be his quarterback when he's interviewing for the head coaching job, and in this case, it was actually Phil Emery, but still, it was, don't want to hear it. And those are examples of guys who know your organization, have been in the building, have correct opinions on things that you choose to ignore because they're not the opinions nice you want phrasing. to hear. And so what did you hear today that makes you think anything's going to be different if a similar scenario comes up in the next couple of weeks where somebody comes in who you may want to hire and they come back in the building. Like, let's just say Morocco Brown is somebody I want to talk about here in a second. He used to work for the Bears. What if he comes in and you think he's he's a great candidate and he's highly recommended by Chris Ballard and you kind of messed up the Chris Ballard thing, so now you're trying to rectify that a little bit and you're like, okay, this, is, this could be our guy. And then he comes in and he says something like, this goes back to you. You asked, I think, this question. What if he says, and this is a total hypothetical, I doubt he will. What if he goes, I don't like Justin Fields. I didn't have high grades on him. Isn't that the hypothetical I yeah, pre yeah, well, presented do, to George McCaskey today? By the way, I don't think that that's ultimately what what happened in that scenario. Right. I'm just saying. Like, but they got to be prepared for this. You don't, know, like. Don't go. You can't go, la, 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 la. Don't want to hear it. <laughs> don't want to hear it. Like, you can't do that. Can't cut that, please. Um <laughs> With the video, um, like you gotta be prepared to hear that, right? You got. They're be. not. They don't want to. They don't want to hear what Olin Krutz has to say. They don't want to hear what Alex Brown has to say. They don't want to hear what guys who've been in that building have to say. That's fair. I think what you worry about is that. They hire a GM or coach who says they like Justin Fields. And then within two years, they're on the free agent market looking at the next guy. Yeah. And then here we go again. We know how that movie plays out. <laughs> I guess in a sense, we're still in it. Still are, and that's why today feels exactly like the same thing we did last year at the same exact time with, a, I think, another live episode and a Johnny Cash intro. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, come on. All right. Um, all right, you're, uh, you're Bill Polian. What are you doing here? Who do you, who do you want to talk to first, Bill? I, like, can I, can I be uh... – I think this is as straightforward as possible. Just you know, you know, like in terms of like hiring Bruce Arians, coach of the year, wants to coach the Bears, likes Jay Cutler, easy decision. No, we're gonna hire the guy from uh, Canada. Canada. <laughs> yeah, they um uh, they they play football in Canada. Yeah, like hockey and curling. Yeah, Jim Harbaugh. Like I get, he's a bit abrasive. He may not tell you what you want to hear, but you know what? I bet you can win you some ball games. And you know what? Maybe he can bring Vic Fangio back with him. You want to run it back to something? Your 49ers teams are pretty good, pretty damn good together. I actually yeah. think I think they had some success against Aaron Rodgers too. Wasn't it three straight NFC Championship games? Yeah. They so one Super Bowl um, appearance. Um. You know what were the reports? A week ago, he's going to entertain NFL teams. Of course, that starts with the team that drafted him. That's to me. That's as simple as it can, as it can get. It's yeah. I, I agree. I think it's the obvious. Uh, I think it checks the the. I, I put out three criteria that I believe in. I think first and foremost, you got to hire somebody who has a, a clear identity for their program, the way they run things that you know you can count on. Not a hypothetical of, oh, what's this guy going to do that's never been a head coach before? And I'm not saying you can't hire a guy who hasn't been a head coach. But, like, if you just take Jeromeo, who's the inside linebacker's coach 
in New England who I've heard great things about and continue to hear great things about, like, okay, he's coming from New England. Like, he's played for the Patriots. Like, you probably have a pretty good idea. And I've heard comparisons to Mike, Mike Vrabel there. And you're seeing great results from Vrabel as how, as how he runs things, right? So that's, Coach of the year. Doesn't necessarily have to be a guy who was a head coach. Just somebody you know who's coming in, you know what you're going to get from the identity. And then I would say in a history of winning. Right, so ideally, again, you like a head coach who's who's proven it, but um, you know the Patriots have won too a lot. So you know, to me, that's a it's a history of winning. If you were to go in the direction of drop mail, and I'm just throwing out you know hypotheticals. George doesn't want to hear the hypotheticals. Um, that's criteria number one. Criteria number two is a good fit with Justin Fields. Not that you can't listen. Ah, to that. sounds like a hypothetical, Adam. Yeah, I'm not going to no, go there. Yeah. <laughs> but just somebody who. And I'm not saying, like, has to totally believe in Justin Fields, but somebody you believe is going to put Justin in position, especially in this next season, where you can fully evaluate him. Because, to me, this was a waste of a rookie season. You don't know what you have. It was choppy. You blew it from the start when you promised Andy Dalton a starting job, and you didn't give Fields the reps he needed in training camp. Okay? So you cannot, whatever it is, you cannot have that happen next season. So that whoever the coaches you hire has to have a plan for Fields that you believe in and you think he can adapt to put Fields in the best position to have success. At a minimum, if he doesn't have success, you're getting a fair evaluation and you're learning about what you have. Okay, so that's number two. Number three is a fit with the defense. A willingness to not shake that up on that side you have pieces there you have a good scheme you don't need to like be switching to a 4-3 um just because that's what you believe in as a head coach all right so getting back to jim harbaugh to me he checks all three of those boxes you know exactly what you're getting with him he has a history of winning in the nfl his offense i think would be a good fit with fields you saw what he did with colin kaepernick in san francisco and oh by the way vic fangio was a defensive coordinator so yeah, dream scenario getting Vic back. But even if he doesn't come back, you could probably keep Sean Desai, same coaching tree, same defense. And I so I, I agree with you. It's a long way of saying I think he's the no-brainer choice. I also am very, 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 very skeptical he actually wants to leave Michigan. And I think he's probably doing a phenomenal job here of getting a nice extension after <laughs> taking a pay cut last year. Didn't he just get an extension like a couple of years ago? Well, he... he they. Um. Well, yeah, but last year he reworked his contract and took a big pay cut. Didn't he just give his bonus to like staff members too? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which he's, was a nice thing. Now he's now you he's know got me. the yeah, but you now he's got the yeah. that was a few weeks ago. Now he's got the Bears interested. In yeah, and he's gonna get a nice little uh, playoff extension. If I had to throw out other names, Brian Flores is on my short list. Uh, Brian the ball from Buffalo. Everything they've done with Josh Allen. Sorry, go on. Uh, just one thing. I can't say I was an expert on Brian Flores before today, but did have a couple conversations trying to figure out why the hell he was fired. Didn't it seem a little suspicious? Like, wow, that was quick for a guy mm-hmm. who was only one game under 500. I'm not sure everybody who was there working with him, and I know there was like immediately it came out like there was friction with the GM and a power struggle. I'm not so sure people on his own staff enjoyed working for him. So I don't think I'm not I'm I don't think Brian Flores is a good fit. That's all I'm saying. I don't think that's a okay. There's limits and there's lines, but. I have no problem. I think with, you can interview him. Yes. I, yeah. I have no problem with staff members, though, under assistant coaches who, like, at the end of the day, the, the head coach makes all the decisions, but he needs to be challenged every now and then, right? Like, sure. Like, I think we saw that play out here where you saw Matt Nagy replace his offensive coordinator, his offensive line coach, all their position coaches throughout the years. Not that I'm saying Matt Nagy is like Brian Flores. I'm just thinking – but then the, the, then the handling of Tua in his rookie season kind of remind you of something. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know. Um, Fair enough. Brian Good Dable, point. though. Brian Dable. Um, Is a it phenomenal the ball or Dable? I think it's Dable. Dable? Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, phenomenal job with Josh Allen. I think that's exactly what you like to see uh, with. Um, He's from the Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick. Bel- it's getting late here in Chicago. Bill Belichick tree. Yep. And, uh, was and Nick coach Saban's under- office. Nick Saban. Yeah, Nick Saban. So, yeah. I, th- again, I, that's first time head coach. Probably f- got a good idea of what you're what you're getting there, though. So, I, I, I like that name, too. I cool like how them. he has just, like, if I were going to compare him to, well, Matt Nagy. I think I mentioned this on our last podcast. That Matt was just from the Andy Reid tree. Sorry, I'm pulling up the bio of Brian Dable. I mean, multiple teams, multiple yeah, he's been organizations. Around. He's he's been around. You know, he's called plays for an elongated period of time and has had success. He's helped develop Josh Allen into the star that he is today. An essential role in that. Top of my list. What about GM? He's always different, right? Yeah. I'll say this. If Jim Harbaugh is your target and you are actually able to persuade him um, to leave, and one quick note on that too. So Stephen Ross, the Dolphins owner, said today that – because that's the connection, right? Everyone thought, oh, he might be trying to go after Harbaugh because he's a huge My- Michigan. Uh, Ross is a huge Michigan supporter, donor. I think his like name is on the facility or something there. Um, says, oh, I'm not going to be the guy that pulls Harbaugh away from Michigan. Well, if he has that much influence in Michigan, and he's not going to be the guy that let's Harbaugh leave for his own team in the NFL. You think he's going to let him leave for a different team? (laughs) Hey, George McCaskey said at the outset of this press conference today that money would not be an issue. Uh, Okay, I'm just saying. So if he wants to go to toe with the University of Michigan with the backing of the Boosters and Stephen Ross, then... How awkward is that, by the way? You have a potential situation where the owner of a different NFL team is outbidding... A different NFL team, but to not come to the team he owns, to just stay where he's at in a different job because it's your the college team that you like. Is that some form of tampering? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know what it is, but it's weird. Yeah. Um, to further your point, though, Jim Harbaugh, I think there's certain situations or, or certain sorry, certain individuals, certain coaches. Where you could go coach GM, coach then GM. Hire the coach first, then you go GM. Like Jim Harbaugh's that guy. Yeah, I was, he actually, is that I was, guy. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I think he's one of the, the few guys. And maybe you'll see that happen. Um, so I don't know. Um, on the GM side, the only one I can totally confirm this point is Rocco Brown, the Colts director of college scouting. Um, was told he's a very strong candidate. Will interview. I think it's come out that he's the Bears already requested permission, um, and he's got an interesting story because, as I mentioned earlier, he's been with the Bears before. Ballard took him over to Indy. They've had some really strong drafts. Um, there's a guy named Braden Smith. I don't know if the casual Bears fan is familiar with. He was a second round pick. The same year the uh, they drafted, I think it was the same year that yeah they drafted uh, Quentin Nelson and Darius Leonard. Hell of a hell of a draft that was. Um, but Braden Smith had short arms. He played guard at Auburn, and as it was told to me, Morocco Brown saw something in him that he's like he's a right tackle. We can play him at right tackle. And even Ballard was like, no, he's a guard. But eventually, due to some injuries, they played him at right tackle as a rookie. Well, he just signed a uh, four-year, $72 million extension. That worked out pretty well. So one of my criteria, and one of my, well, once we get into whoever the GM is and what needs to be fixed... Put in big block letters, offensive line for me. 
build the offense with the line first. Got to get that correct. You have to have a good offensive line. You have to protect Justin Fields. You have to be able to run the football. So if you want to bring in a guy like that who has a strong track record, one of the best GM candidates out there, um, who has obviously a good scouting eye for the O-line, where do you sign me up for that one? If you're a GM who liked Ryan or sorry, if you're a GM who liked Justin Fields, Ryan Pace already did the hard part for you. Mm-hmm. I've said this multiple times on this podcast. Like you have to judge GMs by their quarterback moves, their quarterback decisions, their swings at it. Pace took a lot of them. Now his job is open. So if you like Justin Fields, the hardest part of getting that quarterback has been already completed for you. Now you just got to build around him. Quarterback is the hardest position to evaluate, to get right. We know it here in Chicago so well. Yeah. So if you believe in the guy, Ryan Pace already did the hard part for you. Now you just got to build around him, minus the first round pick this year, but you'll get time. Mm -hmm. You'll get time. Um, I just hope that the Bears cast a bigger net for GM than they did in 2015. Like, by the end of it, you just had Ryan Pace, Chris Ballard, Brian Gain, Lake Dawson. I think two of those guys actually work for the Bills now. You know, you just have to see more, hear more. Get that feedback. Learn more about your team. Hear some criticism. Bears could benefit from it, but wider net than what happened in 2015. And I don't think you'll get the Eric DeCostas of the world or the George Pattons of the world declining because that's what happened in 2015. I think with Justin Fields, Will Quinn Smith, Jalen Johnson, Cole Komet, maybe even Tevin Jenkins, Larry Borm, David Montgomery, I think if you want any candidate, they'll pick up the phone. Yeah, I do. Th- I do think, uh, and and ironically, one of the reasons why this job is going to be attractive is because um, you do report to George. You're in charge of everything with the football side, and George is probably going to give you what you want, what you say you need. So, I from that standpoint, and you have the quarterback, it's an attractive job. If you were a coaching or GM agent and you heard George McCaskey say at the outset that money's not an issue. Oh, money's not an issue. You report directly to the owner who's got a pretty hard track record here. You are writing that down. Money is not an issue. There you go. Money's not an issue, and he's uncomfortable when you ask him personnel decisions. I, I, I it, It's... That's the irony of it is, like, it's... In that sense, it helps them because it's a it's a very attractive job. Still makes me question how it's all going to work when it comes together. But you know, hey, if you get the if you hire the next Bill Polian, eh, it all work out. That's my optimistic ending to the whole thing. Doesn't Bill Polian have a son in personnel? Works for Washington. I think so. Nah, it's not gonna happen. I can't do that. He can't do that. <laughs> <If> they did. <laughs> oh man. No, nah, you can't do that. <laughs> you know. Well, you can. <laughs> you can. There's plenty of nepotism in the NFL. Ugh. Plenty of it. Okay. Any final thoughts? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Have I ever delivered on that? No, I don't think you have. That's um, all right. Follow us on Twitter at Adam Hogue, at Adam Johns. You can read us NBC Sports Chicago dot com and the Athletic the Athletic dot com slash Hogan. I'm just a fan. I'm not a football evaluator. Thanks, George. Um, we'll see where these next couple of weeks go. I know we will be all over it. Okay. We will have you the coverage where we write. We'll be here with the podcasts. 
um, and breaking it down as it all unfolds. We'll see how quick it goes, who becomes the next general manager, how real is this Jim Harbaugh thing, does he have a 10-year extension for Michigan by tomorrow morning, you know, things like that. Jim Harbaugh or bust? If you're watching already, you know where we are. We're on YouTube. Thank you for watching live. If you are one of those people, we'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, please check out obviousshirts.com. If you're listening on the podcast, you can check us out on YouTube. Subscribe to the Hogan Johns YouTube page. You can find the podcast anywhere, Apple, Spotify, Google. On the Athletic ad-free there. Um, and if you are on YouTube, you should hit that notification button. Um, because when we do live episodes like this, you will be notified when it's going to start. So uh, it's a good way to keep up as well. Thanks to everyone for sticking through a long day. Uh, Bears fans, you deserve better. I got to say. You, you, yeah. you, you, and we appreciate that you're always here with us and still consuming all the content because um, you deserve better than you sometimes get from this franchise on uh, days like this. So um, hang in there. Maybe a little higher than the next Bill Polian. Maybe. His Maybe name is Chris. I believe his name is Chris Polian. <laughs> I'm and losing it here. Chris Polian and uh, Steve Belichick. Just, just go that route. Get all the goofy faces on the sideline. Can't go wrong. All the lip licking. <laughs> Is that what he did? Yeah. He did. Sorry. Well. Sorry for that last visual, everybody. <laughs> Good night, everyone. <laughs> See ya.